Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming and seeing my talk here. Appreciate it. Hope everybody had a good lunch. So, microbial inoculation of clonally propagated plant starts. So, you know, I consider this more of a white paper, just so I think everybody in the room needs to be informed. You know, we're non-scholar. You know, really honored to be here in, you know, this facility with this crowd and, you know, this audience. We really have a passion for cannabis and the scholarly side of it is something that we really just have enjoyed as a fan base and really using those as tools to advance our learning. So appreciate everybody in this room and this community a lot. I'm Daniel Hendricks. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Hendricks Farm. Uh, we're a cannabis clone nursery. So we're located in Humboldt County. We have four operating partners. Uh, all of the founders were born in Humboldt County. We uh, are a commercial nursery, so what we do is we create clonal starts for other businesses uh, in specifically Humboldt County, but all around Humble uh, California. We have our annual license uh, right in there in the beautiful redwood rainforest of Humboldt County. And uh, people have rather enjoyed our services and we're really grateful for that. It's our community. And that's kind of how we discovered this opportunity to do some research into how we can maybe contribute to a better product and just a more environmentally sound cannabis industry. So in Humboldt County, it's the Redwood Rainforest. Mycelium connects all of these trees. They're able to talk and communicate with each other. What they do is they signal to each other you know, pathogens, nutrient exchange, a lot of really amazing stuff. So underneath our feet is this web of really intelligent, you know, bacterial biotechnical applications. And I don't know how trained everybody is. I'm sure everybody has a really strong understanding of some of this stuff, but I'm gonna go over it anyways, just give some general terms. So rhizobacteria are root colonizing bacteria that form symbiotic relationships with many plants. So in other industries, this is a really common application. Plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, PGPRs have been reported to support plant growth, suppress plant diseases, and increase the yield productivity of many crop producing plants. So in all other agricultural industries, this is really common. They inoculate their crops, they see different kind of agricultural results and you know the term plant growth promoting rhizobacteria is just an attractive you know acronym we want to see our plants perform better and, and maybe this is a good opportunity for us to discover how so like i said non-scholar the the way i was introduced to these kind of concepts you know was from jeff lowenfels and elaine ingram you know i worked in the cannabis industry as a pot grower, you know, for over 20 years. And it was around 2014, I started to get my curiosity going about what other types of applications, what other industries could help influence the cannabis industry. Because I believed legalization was gonna have a major impact and the cannabis was going to be a big part of our economic success in California, in the country, in our community, in Humboldt. So the concept of the soil food web is, to me, common sense. You know, the big things eat the smaller things, and specifically right there at that bacterial point, you know, the bacteria are able to digest and make more available all of these amazing, you know, phosphates, all kinds of nutrient supply that's already there in your soil. So the bacteria is able to break that down and deliver it to your rhizosphere, to your roots of your plant. Now, that is amazingly interesting, okay? So, I get to introduce to this concept, and here we are, I'm working at Daisy Supply in Humboldt County. We're sourcing nutrients for other farmers on the emergence of legalization. And with that came a lot of companies wanting to introduce their new products. Everybody had a new product and a new solution that was going to recreate cannabis. And one of the most interesting that I encountered back then was this bacteria Rhodopseudomonas palustris. So Rhodopseudomonas palustris is a gram-negative 
non-sulfur purple rod-shaped bacterium found both in aerobic and anaerobic environments. So that means it can survive without oxygen. That alone is a pretty exceptional testament to this bacteria's strength. And how to use it in cannabis, well, we wanted to find out you know, the evidence. So there was this product uh, that was being used in the agricultural industry, and our customers started to attract to it. They wanted to use this bacterial inoculant and they were claiming these amazing results. This bacteria has potential for bioremediation. It breaks down waste in polluted environments. That's been proven. Uh, it can produce hydrogen as a result of nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen fixation is pretty incredible. It can fix nitrogen and create that nitrogen to make it available to your plant. It produces ATP, which the plant uses as energy, and it has the capacity and the capability to fix carbon dioxide as a biomass through photosynthesis. So that was what really struck me as amazing. This bacteria, you know, is able to absorb parts of the light spectrum that the plant can't. Your plant really only needs, is only able to absorb that central portion of the light spectrum right there in the visible light spectrum. But bacteria, they're able to convert infrared or ultraviolet light and use it as an energy or a food source. So Rhodocinomonas palustris was able to use that energy, infrared and ultraviolet, to food their, uh, feed their food source and fix carbon out of carbon dioxide, out of the atmosphere. And so your plant doesn't have to expend energy to fix carbon when Rhodocinomonas palustris is doing it for you. So your plant may use that energy to produce biomass, produce cannabinoids, we don't really know. So this struck me as really interesting, right? And as most ag products enter the market, there's not a lot of testing. So this ag product, this company saw an, an opportunity in cannabis and they made a cannabis specific product, which was a diluted uh, Rhodocinomonas palustris and they had a consortium of bacillus, other things, and they suggested a dramatic increase in the usage of the product. And that was one of those moments where I froze. I said, I don't see any evidence why we should be increasing the usage of this bacteria uh, so drastically just for cannabis. I felt like that was kind of a ploy to use the product more. So I, I wanted to see some studies being done. So in 2014, I took a break from the product, but I continued to take an interest in what advancements were being made in cannabis that might help justify use of these products. So one of the papers written that I really enjoyed by Max Winston and a number of other uh, authors, it, they published it in Chicago, but the studies were done here in California, understanding cultivar specificity and soil determinants of the cannabis microbiome. So the rhizosphere, what Max and, and his colleagues were able to establish is that rhizosphere bacteria will colonize root tissue. Okay, that's a, that's a great start. We know that cannabis and the rhizosphere bacteria will actually colonize in the area and also move into the plant tissue. He did a study with sour diesel, Buku Kush, Burmese cultivars, Maui Waui, and White Widow. And the objective was to understand how that soil bacterial presence was going to be distributed into the plant if there was a synergy or a capability there and what effect that might have on potency. So what he discovered was that the uh, composition of the soil and the cultivar specificity determine the microbiome. So what cultivar or clone you might use is going to determine what bacteria the plant allows to come out of the soil and become part of the actual colonize the actual vascular root tissue. Uh, he discovered that cannabinoid concentration and composition was significantly correlated with the structure of the endorhizo community. So what he found is certain bacterial presence in the soil were also associated with certain cannabinoid concentrations. Really interesting stuff, right? Okay, the bacteria in the soil are going to help us determine what our potencies might be, what other terpene or cannabinoid profiles might be present. 
So the composition of the endorheic communities also suggested root decay. So in one of his studies, he wasn't able to get to the endorheic root tissue until eight weeks later. Weren't sure if uh, how that overall affected some of his results, but a really great paper, open source, really helpful. Uh, four years later, uh, Marianne Scott, uh, published in the Canadian Journal of Microbiology, along with a number of other of her colleagues at McGill University, published this paper, Endophytes of Industrial Hemp, Cannabis Sativa, Cultivars, Identification of Cultural ba Bacteria and Fungi in Leaves, Petioles, and Seeds. So with these hemp cultivars, Yvonne, CRS1, Anka, they took the plant tissue from the leaves, petioles, and seed embryos and did an analysis. They, they wanted to see what was there and what was present naturally in this hemp cultivar's natural microbiome. And what they discovered it was really interesting and, and also caught my eye thinking about this Rhodocetomonas palustris. So 44% of the natural microbiome in the leaves uh, were Pseudomonas and 16% were Bacillus. In the petioles, 39% were Pseudomonas, as well as a presence of Bacillus. Bacillus made up 18% of the seeds, and we actually didn't see as much Pseudomonas within the seed embryos. So for me, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm not a scholar. I look at this and I say, well, there's a tremendous opportunity. You know, if naturally the microbiome already is made up of this Pseudomonas taxa, then we probably have a good opportunity that to see that it might uh, adhere and be able to colonize the cannabis uh, root tissue. Uh, the highest abundance of bacterial strains isolated from leaves were isolates of Pseudomonas and Bacillus, respectively. That's a quote from Marianne Scott's paper, and there's a phyllo tree. Uh, I know you can't see anything, but that does show, you know, all the different species and strains that are present there. Uh, the most frequently isolated endophytes belonging to the gram-negative genre of Pseudomonas, 35% and Pantoea, 17%, and the gram-positive genres, Staphylococcus, 16%, and Bacillus, 9%. So again, I read this and I'm getting excited. I know of a product that you know, needs more research done on it, and, and really, we want to see this kind of synergy uh, at, at our facility. So looking at this you know, uh, table here, we have several bacteria. These are the ba some of the bacteria gen genuses that were present uh, in this study. And these different biochemical uh, applications, cellulase, phosphatase, ACN, siderophore production, organic acid production, we see that Pseudomonas, if I can get this to work, has a presence of all of these different biochemical applications. So it has a positive association there. Bacillus, uh, oops, looks like I went to the next screen. Bacillus uh, was able to be really, you know, efficient here at this phosphorus uh, conversion. So that is one of the most like powerful clues for me that, hey, this might have an effect downstream with, you know, flower development and flower potency efficiency. So in this paper, she establishes there's an immense abundance of Pseudomonas and Bacillus in the natural microbiome. That makes me feel like this is maybe a good opportunity to try these different inoculants. And also, ethically, it feels like I'm not introducing anything too foreign. This is something that's already common within cannabis. Her study also used only hemp cultivars. So as a THC cannabis clone producer, I uh, was curious, does this work with THC or is this only a CBD, you know, hemp cultivar application? There was another study done in 2018 that is not open access, so I didn't share a lot from it there, but it also further established that Fenola hemp was highly receptive to PGPRs in seedling form. So in their study, they inoculated seedlings, found that uh, those bacteria were easily able to colonize colonize the vascular root tissue and establish a presence within the plant. Uh, the other thing that they were able to establish was that there is a significant cannabinoid increase, that the 
plants that were inoculated with the bacteria had a cannabinoid increase. Wow, I think that is really powerful stuff. So our big concept, PGPRs can increase yield and secondary metabolites of other crops. Is this same true for medical cannabis cultivars? So this was our moment to say, okay, how can we contribute and how can we make our product better for our farmers down the, down the line? So we took one of our clones and we introduced a cannabis root inoculant. We went back and we had the opportunity now to test this product that so many years ago hadn't been tested. And let's see, let's see if the results can match the potential. So naturally, like I said, we saw a tremendous justification for using Pseudomonas and Bacillus. Rhodopseudomonas palustris has been inoculated in grain and demonstrated a 9% yield increase. Uh, that could be something that would be really beneficial to our farmers. A 9% yield increase affects your bottom line, and, and that's really powerful. Bacillus subtilis, Bacillus megatarium, and Bacillus lachenformis, they're all able to promote plant root health and stimulate root hairs, cells, increase nutrient acquisition. So in our experiment, we took the product Symthriotic Plus. It was a product that I said had been built specifically for the cannabis industry. And we wanted to see if any of these claims uh, uh, of the productivity in other crops could be applied to cannabis. So we made three inoculums. We had a control with no treatment at all. We had a one ounce per gallon, which was the minimum suggestion on the bottle, and then we had a one quarter ounce uh, per gallon suggestion as well. In the Finola uh, experiment, we also saw that there was a max point, that you can use too much of an inoculant, in which case their results demonstrated that yield and potency actually might go down if it's used in excess. So there we are at Rambling Rose Farm. That's another licensed producer in Humboldt County. I don't know why. Oh, it's up here on this screen. You guys can see the Humboldt County outline. That, all, that's where we're located, Humboldt County, Northern California, Rambling Rose, as well as the producers of this bacteria. That's CC with Simbiz. We're all sitting there pondering uh, the, the potential of these results. All three of us were blind to the study. We only had one person at our facility that knew which batch was inoculated, so we had no clue uh, which, which batch uh, contained the inoculant, which ones were the control. Uh, there's us taking some of the sampling. Uh, this was actually not the official sampling. We did some early sampling tests as well, just to compare the lower and the top of the plant, see different kind of potency results as well. So the results were really amazing. We, we, we saw positive results across the board. And just to demonstrate right here, lower twin X, got the highest total harvest, had the highest trim weight as well as the highest flower weight. Uh, lower twin Z had the lowest total harvest weight and lower twin, or lower twin Y and lower twin Z uh, was second with 5,375 grams. Over here is the potency, lower twin X, overall combined potency THC and THCA was 17.97. Lower twin Y, 15.27, and lower twin Z, 14.6. And so we would hope that this would help us clue in that maybe lower twin X was the one that contained the inoculant. So this is uh, the overall weight that combines trim and flower. And this is a bar graph of the potency. And so yes, we find that 17.97, this highest potency was lower twin X. This received the highest inoculum. Lower twin Y, 15.27, that received the one quarter uh, ounce inoculum, so the minimum strength inoculant. And then this was the control. So really nice cascading graph there. That was really pleasing, especially uh, to the farmer who got an 18.75 increase in THC and THCA combined versus his control and found an overall harvest yield increase demonstrated significant 9.9%. So 
you can imagine uh, these kind of results scaled across an entire acre. You know, if we are, should get so lucky as to be able to repeat something like this, that might be really powerful. So some of the other things that, you know, come up in this discussion, we, so we found an increased yield and we found an increased potency in, in our test trial. And we don't anticipate that this is gonna be uniform. We, we're gonna need lots of other studies to verify this, but there's so many other potentials. We found that in the tobacco industry, they've been dis using rhodocinomonas to test its validity as an inoculant to prevent TMV, tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, right after our paper was uh, published in Testing in Terpene Magazine, uh, another paper was printed in 2019, further uh, exemplifying that we need more research on specifically these two bacteria. So, uh, Dong Mai Lu, excuse me for uh, mispronouncing his name if I did that. He wrote this paper along with his colleagues, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria for cannabis production, yield, cannabinoid profile, and disease resistance. And that just uh, immediately leapt off the table. I, I read it, worried that he'd beat me to all of my research, but uh, he was actually just helping us justify further that res research needs to be done specifically on these two. So the potential role of PGPR is focused on two genera, Pseudomonas and Bacillus in his paper. And he predicted that it will achieve higher yields, have more desirable cannabinoid profiles as well as disease resistance. Uh, plant growth, this is the same paper. Uh, so biological control and de disease resistance associated with PGPRs. Powdery mildew and blight control. Well, these things are virtually unexplored in cannabis production. You know, these bacterial inoculants may have uh, very powerful defense mechanisms against crop, uh, crop damage that everyone in this industry is experiencing. So, you know, we see this as just further justification that the small bit of research that we do, we've done needs to go a lot further. And, and it could potentially, you know, affect more than just our yield and harvest quality. It may affect the overall health and disease control within the industry as a whole. So, it, it has capabilities, a potential, you know, as a plant pathogen defense. Rhodocinomonas palustris has been researched as a plant defense and biocontrol induction of plant resistance of tobacco mosaic virus infection. So it would be really powerful uh, knowing that this tobacco mosaic virus uh, right now is causing problems within the cannabis industry. It'd be great to see uh, some defense mechanisms against it. It could have uh, a huge environmental impact. So similar crops inoculated have demonstrated higher yield with less water and less fertilizer usage. Uh, Rhodocinomonas has the potential to retain uh, moisture. So during those drought periods, crops tend to have a lot less stress and a lot less stress effects based on the fact that the bacteria are able to retain the, the moisture within their own uh, body, and as they die, they release that moisture back to the plant. So it, it helps uh, mitigate stress. And then, of course, quality and yield. You know, Pseudomonas and Bacillus inoculate has potential as an affordable and environmentally friendly application. So, you know, all we had to do in order to see these results in the field was make a very, very, small, maybe two gallon batch of this inoculant and, and just submerge the plants and the root tissue in it. We never went out and inoculated in the field. We never did anything different with any of those crops. All we had was this single stage. So the farmer didn't have to do anything different and, and what an amazing, you know, potential result. Uh, thank you. We really appreciate you guys coming today. This is some gelato grown by uh, uh, Rambling Rose Farm. They did a wonderful and beautiful job. And uh, if you have any questions or you'd like to get a hold of me, there's my information. Thank you. If anybody has any questions.
Hi. I know in California, you don't have to test for total aerobic bacteria. But have you tested to see if this increase in microbials will artificially inflate total testing? No, I haven't, and that's a really good question. I, I've been asking some of the testing companies uh, if they're able to identify between, you know, plant growth promoting bacteria and, you know, potential harmful pathogens, and that's not really something that they're doing right now. So that that is a really good question, and, and definitely something that we all need to take a look at. Okay. Yeah, to her point, um, uh, a lot of the testing labs are doing plating, at least where I come from in Massachusetts. And plating is notorious because I can't tell the difference not only between bacterial strains but even live and dead bacteria. Mm -hmm. So it's caused a big issue. Um, so I, I think it would behoove you to have uh, really a ready answer for whether uh, possibly this bacteria could in fact cause a failure in a test uh, to take place because it's, it's an important question. But m my question is really um, uh, when you're applying this inoculant. Uh, do, do you have any um, notion of uh, uh, the uh, degradation period of the bacteria? In other words, like how long after exposure um, is is the bacteria going to be uh, soluble it's a, uh, without being degraded? Right. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. That's a really good question. You know, I know that the product that we use is guarantees a shelf stability for 18 months before you open the bottle, and then once you open the lid, it guarantees another six months where before the bacteria starts to degrade. So this, in this case, they stabilize it in a liquid, and so by having it in a liquid, they're able to actually have the community feed and continue to grow while it's on the shelf. But I think that ultimately, we have to take a, a much more scientific approach to answer some of those questions. All those bacteria need to be individually studied and different combinations of those consortiums need to be analyzed so we can actually try and determine what bacteria are even contributing. And I, and I would love to work with you know, any of the intelligent minds in this room and at this facility to help answer those questions. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. First, let me say I thought it was an excellent bit of research. Uh, my question for you is, do you have research plans continue going forward? Uh, yeah, I don't think we've framed those plans yet. You know, we kind of put this together as a white paper. I didn't even really necessarily think that it was going to be something that we'd even develop into this, you know, kind of a publication or this kind of an opportunity. And it, I think that you know, we, like I said, being non-scholars, we really want to look to the community to see, well, what, what weaknesses, you know, are, are we presenting here in our approach and, and how can we make it better? So we're open to suggestion. Okay. I'm Dr. Roger Kern. I am a plant scientist and microbiologist originally out of UC Davis. I'd love to sit down and just talk with you about where you see things going. Yeah, Great we really job. appreciate that. Thank you. Look forward to that. Hi, Daniel. Uh, hey. Can you talk to root exudates as far as a mechanism for stimulating the ribosome to be more productive for the release of nutrients back into the root system? I am not qualified. I, I, you know, I, I definitely enjoy, you know, all the literature, but I wouldn't say that I'm qualified to, to actually answer that question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it.